Hello, Confirmation students, and welcome back to Confirmation. In this week's lesson, we're going to be looking at a rather unique book in the Bible, the Book of Psalms, which is sometimes called the Psalter. In today's lesson, I want to focus in on three main topics. The first topic is just a little bit of background information. What are the Psalms exactly, and how do we as Christians use the Psalms um, in our daily and devotional life? The second topic is to look a little bit at some of the unique characteristics of Hebrew poetry that we find in the Psalms. You're going to need your Bible and a piece of paper and a pen or pencil for this part of the lesson. Lastly, we'll look at and talk about the different kinds of Psalms that you find in the Psalter. Okay, so I'm going to ask that you pause the video now and go and grab your Bible and a piece of paper and something to write with, and I'll see you back in a couple of minutes. All right, let's get started. So what exactly is a psalm? At a very basic level, the psalms are poems. They are the poetry of our faith, and they deal with and give voice to a wide range of human experiences and emotions. This collection of 150 poems or psalms are also prayers, prayers written to give praise to God, to ask God for help, to express the prayer's frustration or anger or remorse to God. Generations of Jews and Christians have used the Psalms as a way to pray to God. Here's a fun fact for you. The first book ever printed in the United States, actually it was printed in the American colonies, was the Psalter. It was the Bay Psalm Book, which was a collection of Psalms for use in worship in Massachusetts. It was printed in Massachusetts in 1640. Jesus too prayed the Psalms. On the cross, Jesus prays from two different Psalms. In the Gospel according to Mark, we hear, we hear Jesus pray Psalm 22. This is Mark chapter 15, verse 34. At three o'clock, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a direct quote of the very beginning of Psalm 22, which reads, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me from the words of my groaning? And in the Gospel according to Luke, we hear Jesus pray Psalm 31. This is Luke chapter 23, verse 46. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. This is a quote of Psalm 31, verse 5, which reads, into your hand I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, faithful God. When I get stuck and don't know what to pray or when I don't know what your words to use in my own prayers, I too turn to the Psalms and pray the words that I find there. I encourage you to give this a try. All right, so far we have learned that the Psalms are poems and that they are prayers, but they are also songs. One of the things that you'll notice when you open your Bible and look at the Psalms is that many of them have what we call a superscription. That's a little note that tells you a bit about the Psalm. And it's written in small print between the psalm number and the start of the psalm. So I'm going to go ahead and ask you to get out your Bible right now and open to Psalm 66. You'll find that on page 612 of your Bible. 
and it should look something like what I have on the screen here. It says Psalm 66 at the top, and then underneath it says, Praise for God's goodness to Israel. This is a title for the psalm that has been added by the editor of your Bible, of the, of the version of the Bible that you have. This is not a part of the original Hebrew text of the psalm. And then underneath that, in little itty bitty print, are the words, to the leader, a song, a psalm. This is the part that we call the superscription. And it was most likely added by the first people who edited and put the book of Psalms together for the Bible. It is a part of the Hebrew text and those words are always a part of verse one in the Hebrew text of the Psalm. Sometimes the superscriptions do more than just label the psalm as a song. Sometimes they offer musical advice or directions. For example, the superscription to Psalm 5 says, to the leader for the flutes, or Psalm 55 says, to the leader with stringed instruments. The ancient Israelites were not the only ones to sing these psalms in worship. We do too. Perhaps the most well-known psalm in the Psalter is Psalm 23, and it starts like this. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. In the hymnal that we use in our worship services, it's called the Evangelical Lutheran Worship. It's a red or a cranberry colored book. There are four hymns that are based on just this one psalm. The hymns, The Lord's My Shepherd, the hymn, The King of Love My Shepherd Is, the hymn, Shepherd Me, O God, and the hymn, My Shepherd, You Supply My Need. All of these are hymns that are direct settings, direct quotations of Psalm 23. And there are many, many more hymns that make reference to Psalm 23. And of course, our hymnal has other hymns that are based on other psalms as well. And actually, the first 150 hymns in our hymnal are the psalms you'll find just the text of the Psalms written in the hymnal, and they're marked um, in such a way so that they can be chanted, which on occasion we do do in worship. For example, I have Psalm 150 um, written on the next couple of slides here, and I have uh, brought it up in the way that it is written in the hymnal. It's marked to be chanted, and this is how it works you are going to sing the first words of the verse up until you get to this vertical slash here using this first long held note. And then the words that come after the vertical slash, you use these moving notes to sing. Then for the second half of the verse, you do the same thing. You sing the opening words using this long held note, and you use these moving notes to sing the last words, or in this case, word. And it goes like this. I encourage you to try to sing along with me as you are able, as you get the hang of it. But it sounds like this. Hallelujah, praise God in the holy temple. Praise God in the mighty firmament. Praise God for mighty acts. Praise God for exceeding greatness. Praise God with trumpet sound. Praise God with lyre and harp. Praise God with tambourine and dance. Praise God with strings and pipe. Praise God with resounding cymbals. Praise God with loud clanging cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Okay, so psalms are poems, and they are prayers to be prayed, and they are songs to be sung and chanted. I bet if I were to ask you to name a 
characteristic of poetry, especially poems in English. Many of you would mention rhyming. Not that poems have to rhyme in order to be a poem, but we often associate rhymes and rhyming with poetry. In Hebrew, however, rhyming is not so important. Instead, one of the main characteristics of Hebrew poetry, both the poetry you find in the Psalms, but also the poetry that you find written in the books of the prophets, is repetition. Hebrew poetry repeats itself. It says the same thing twice, but using slightly different words. You can think of it as an echo. For example, I have on the screen, screen Psalm 147, verse 12, which reads, Praise the Lord, O Jerusalem. Praise your God, O Zion. There are two repetitions here. We have praise the Lord in the first half of the verse, and that's repeated or echoed in the second half of the verse with the words, praise your God. And in the first half of the verse, we have, O Jerusalem, and in the second half of the verse, we have, O Zion. Here's another example, this time from Psalm 27, verse 1. See if you can hear and see where those echoes, where that repetition is. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? So in this verse, we have light and salvation being compared to or echoed with the words stronghold of my life. And then we have the question, whom shall I fear, being echoed using the question, whom, of whom shall I be afraid? Sometimes, though, the uh, repetition does more than just echo. Sometimes it expands the meaning of the original idea. So here in Psalm 146, this is verse 1, we hear praise the Lord, and then it's echoed and extended, praise the Lord, O my soul. Again, here's another example of an extension. Happy are those who do not follow the advice of the wicked, or stand in the path of sinners, or sit in the seat of scoffers. Okay, so now that you have learned a little bit about biblical poetry, it's time to give it a try and write a psalm. I've provided for you on the screen the first half of each line of a psalm. Your job is to write the second half by echoing the first line or extending the first line, and I've given you directions to do that. You need some inspiration? Try reading through a few psalms for ideas. I'll ask you now to go ahead and pause the video so that you can write your psalm. And then when you come to your next small group meeting, bring your finished psalm with so that we can read them and share them together. Okay, well, welcome back. So far today, we've learned that psalms are poems and prayers and songs, and we've learned a little bit about one of the features of Hebrew poetry. In the time that we have left, I want to talk about the different kinds of psalms that you can find in the Psalter. There are lots of different ways that people have categorized the psalms over the years. None of the categorizations work perfectly to characterize the wide variety of psalms. But I think it's still helpful to have some way to organize the psalms. And so I want to share one classification system that I learned years ago from an Old Testament professor and pastor of mine by the name of Mark Throntveit. He divided the psalms into four groups, glad, mad, sad, and I've been bad. We'll go ahead and look at each of these in turn. The glad psalms are psalms that express joy and happiness. The psalmist gives thanks and offers praise to God for all that God has done. We've already seen an example of a glad psalm earlier in the lesson, Psalm 150, which we chanted together. 
Psalm 150 is part of a group of five glad psalms that bring the whole book of psalms to a close. Other glad psalms include Psalm 8, which is a psalm that praises God for the creation, um, and Psalm 117, which, by the way, is the shortest psalm in the Psalter, just two verses. There are lots of other examples of glad psalms in the Bible. The next group of psalms are the mad psalms. These are psalms that express anger or frustration about what is happening in the psalmist's life. And these psalms ask and sometimes even demand that God do something about it and that God do something about it right now. Sometimes the psalmist seems to be frustrated with a situation. Sometimes the psalmist is angry with a person or people they know. And sometimes the psalmist is angry with God and blames God for the situation he finds himself in. Sometimes the psalmist is so angry that she goes as far as to suggest that God curse or destroy her enemy. Whoa. The mad psalms contain some of the harshest words in the Psalter, but these harsh words are a reminder that it is both okay and faithful to share with God our deepest, darkest, angriest feelings, even when what we are feeling is anger towards God. The third group of psalms are the sad psalms. These are psalms that express sorrow or grief or sadness. They are prayers prayed in moments of need and doubt and they call upon God to help. Most of these psalms, but not all, but most of them end as glad psalms with the psalmist praising God for God's help or expressing confidence that God will surely help. Perhaps the best known example from this group is Psalm 13, which you can find on page 577 in your Bible. Here's kind of how a sad psalm works. In verses one and two, the psalmist names his complaint. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long must I bear pain in my soul and have sorrow in my heart all day long? How long shall my enemy be exalted over me? That's the complaint. That's what's wrong. That's what's going wrong in the psalmist's life. Then in the first half of verse three, the psalmist asks God for help. Consider and answer me, O Lord, my God, give light to my eyes. In the second half of verse three and in verse four, the psalmist gives God some reason to act. The psalmist tells God what will happen if God doesn't act, if God chooses to ignore the psalmist. The psalmist writes, or I will sleep the sleep of death and my enemy will say, I have prevailed. My foes will rejoice because I am shaken. Between verses four and five, it seems as though God did in fact act to bring about some kind of salvation for the psalmist. We don't know exactly what God did or how long it took, but something has changed. And now the psalmist expresses trust in God and praises God for what God has done. The psalmist writes, but I trusted in your steadfast love my heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord because he has dealt bountifully with me. The last group of psalms are the I've been bad psalms. This is the smallest group of psalms. There are only seven that fall in this category. In these psalms, the psalmist admits or confesses to having done something wrong and seeks God's forgiveness. We usually read one of these Psalms, Psalm 51, as part of our worship on Ash Wednesday. 
Like some of the mad psalms, this small group of I've been bad psalms remind us that it is both okay and faithful to turn to God in prayer in all moments of our lives, in our worst moments, when we're most um, ashamed of what we've done, when we're embarrassed by what we've done, God still longs to hear from us and talk to us in order to remind us of God's enduring love and to offer God's word of love and grace and mercy and forgiveness for us. Today we've had a chance to explore what a psalm is, and we've had a chance to talk a little bit about some of the unique features of Hebrew poetry, and we've even written our own psalm. Lastly, we talked about the different kinds of psalms that you can find in the Psalter. Well, I hope you have enjoyed this introduction to the Psalms, and I look forward to seeing you in small groups soon. And don't forget to bring your psalm with you.